three, two, one. <laughs> We're building some of the largest rockets Kerbal has ever seen. Some of. There are people that do ridiculously insane shit in this game. But go to GreenManGaming.com to support our endeavors, which are just as good. Come on, head down to the description. Hey, audience, you're here. Thanks for coming back to the Head Hunter Space program. Uh, so, I got a Delta V calculator out for us for this first experiment, um, we're going to see exactly what this thing is capable of. So in the last episode, we fully fueled the Pegasus. That is every single tank, including the one on the nose. So this is, as I quoted, filled to the gills with fuel. The absolute gills. It has a full tank. So, with that full tank, we get a respectable 6,556 meters per second of delta V. Now, it to go from the surface of Kerbin to low orbit Kerbin, where we are now, that takes 4,590 meters per second of delta V. Now, granted, that's flying through an atmosphere, which this thing will never do unless we deorbit it, which we might in order to build a better one. But even then, we might still just keep this one, just for the hell of it. Anyway, uh, so let's have our journey start in low orbit. So, Duna, which is our destination, and we're, and we're only taking this thing to low orbit, so low orbit from Kerbin to low orbit in d d of Duna is 1,540 meters per second. Now that's one way, which means we need to pull out an actual calculator in order to get a proper estimate. So 1,540 meters per second of delta V times two for a round trip is 3,080 meters per second. Just about half our fuel, more or less. Um, well, let's try low orbit of Kerbin to Ike, which is actually a bit more, 1,780 meters per second of delta V. Gilly, however, which is one of the destinations I have planned, has the lowest gravitational pull of any body in the Kerbal system. Gilly... Delta V, cards on the table, going from Kerbin to Gilly, would require 3,390 meters per second. That's cards on the table. Now, granted, we could probably get into orbit around Eve and have a smaller spacecraft do all the maneuvering to get to Gilly on its own, but that's where we stand. Speaking of Eve, low orbit from Kerbin to low orbit around Eve is about the same as trying to get to Ike, 1,780. In fact, it's exactly the same amount of delta V, 1,780. But there's also Drez, which is a planet that is not talked about a lot in Kerbal Space Program. A one-way trip to Drez would cost 1,400... 4,440 meters per second, which means that would be one way. We're not coming back. Basically, we're confined to the area of Kerbin, Eve, and Duna for this, because if we try to get to Moho, we don't actually have enough fuel to get to Moho. That's 7,640 meters per second delta V. Which basically means we'll probably just have to either build the Odyssey 2 or just get a single solitary dedicated craft to go to Moho or the outer Jewel systems. Speaking of Jewel, low orbit around Kerbin to low orbit around Jewel is 2,710 meters per second. And the reason that's lower is because with Moho, we basically have to perform a sun dive. And sun dives take a lot of fuel. So we could potentially do a round trip to Joule 
if my calculations are correct. It's 2,710 meters per second times two for round trip. It's 5,420 meters per second. If we could get a relatively light landing craft and land on something extremely light, which means we're not going to Tylo, we could potentially make that happen with the Odyssey one with its current engine. But uh, the reason we wouldn't be going to Tylo is because from the to get from low orbit on Tylo to the surface of Tylo, is 2,600 meters per second of delta V, which is a lot for a moon. In fact, that is actually the highest amount of delta V required to land on a moon in this game because Tylo is extremely dense and has a ridiculously strong gravitational pull and very high gravity. And getting from the surface of Tylo to low orbit is another 2,610 meters per second, which is basically requiring 6,000 meters per second on your lander. The lander we're going to be sending up during this episode is significantly less than that. Lath, however, Lath is a different story. To get from low orbit of Lath to the surface of Lath, is zero meters per second. Lath has an oxygen-rich atmosphere, which means we also have a unique opportunity if we were to go to Lath. Jets. Jets would allow us to get from the surface of Lath to orbit around Lath relatively easily. However, the rapier engines would not be a viable option with a Starshot model unless I were to science the shit out of it which I probably could. But low orbit around Kerbid to low orbit around Lath is 3,780 meters per second. And this rocket is extremely heavy. Like, extremely heavy. This is the heaviest thing I have by a long shot. The space station, even the satellite of love is lighter than this. And yes, the satellite of love in this save is a dog bone shaped spaceship where they watch cheesy movies. Now, the big question is, I mentioned in the last episode, ELU. Low orbit Kerbin to low orbit ELU is 5,510 meters per second. So it would be one way. If we did a flyby or an intercept... If we were to do an intercept, it would be 3,930 meters per second. Which means if we just did a flyby and, like, dropped a probe on it, that would be that uh, a probe light enough to kill all of its velocity and actually land on the surface of Elu, which has about the same... Let me do the science here. Okay, never mind. It has a slightly higher gravitational pull than the Mun. To go from low orbit around the Mun to the surface of the Mun, it's 60, 670 meters per second. Low orbit to the surface of Elu is 710. And before you ask, low orbit on Gilly to the surface of Gilly is 30 meters per second. 30. A Kerbal with their jetpack, could pull that off. Which is amazing. <laughs> anyway, I mentioned a lander, but uh, there's just one more. There are very small moons around Jewel. They are Pole and Bop. For, the, for, uh, for us to go from low orbit to Jewel to low orbit around Pole, it would be 4,800 meters per second. Low orbit around Joule to low orbit around Bop, 6,800. However, low orbit to the surface of Bop is 260 meters per second. Pull to the surface is even less at 150, which means an extremely light lander would be able to make it there. If, if Pegasus were to only go in orbit 
around Jewel. Now, we don't know how heavy the lander on this thing is going to be yet. And we don't know how that's going to affect its meters per second delta V. So why don't we go find out? Open up the shield here. And let's go get it. Okay, here we are. This is the Starshot Destiny class. Uh, I just like to, before we launch here today, I would like to go over some of the changes to the standard Starshot model. Now, first off, we got all the crew off of this thing because it's launching on man. Now, the first thing you'll notice is the much larger fuel tanks. I took off the atomic rocket motors and replaced them with these aerospike dart liquid fuel engines, which have an impressive uh, meters per second delta V ratio. Uh, fuel to delta V ratio is phenomenal on these engines. Um, but also, the main stage has been replaced as well. Before we had, I believe it was the Poodle, now we have the Bobcat, which is a much more efficient engine. Like, just let me show you guys immediately. They also changed the model of the Poodle. This is the new Poodle, which gives us 436 meters per second. This is what we were using on the Mun shots, the Minmus shots, all of the Starshot main engines, Apparently it just sucked, but put the Bobcat on, we get 1,382 meters per second delta V. Even better in a vacuum, actually. Which I did not test the Poodle engine with its vacuum ratio. Well, okay, wait, hang on. That's 1,694. I didn't do the math correctly, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Poodle Engine! However, Bobcat does have a much better atmospheric ratio, and we're gonna be using it to escape Duna's atmosphere a little bit. Just a little bit. So we are gonna need that extra kick. So we will be going with the Bobcat. But otherwise, for other missions, the Poodle, absolutely a viable option. Because its vacuum ratio is fantastic. This is a new Too Smart as well. Uh, the antenna has been moved to the very back of the rover. Not the very back, but the back. Uh, roughly where the um, fuel tank is. Like right next to the fuel tank, a couple of the battery packs and the trunk. But we also have this new scanning arm which, unlike the arms on the ship itself, this does not glitch out because it doesn't have any rotors. That's the main thing screwing up those arms is the rotors. We'll take the rotors off on the next tool shed. But another good thing is this is now perfectly centralized on the side of the rocket and it's held in place on the back here by a single strut we have four trunks on board with ladder access to all four trunks. Each one carries two pieces of equipment just to keep it balanced. Bigger fuel tanks, work lights, a big old communications antenna, and parachutes. And a lot of inline stabilizers. This is going to be the most controllable craft we have available the most controllable craft we have available. And with that, let's get this thing on the pad and up to the ship. Oh, and also, just real quick, our launch vehicle today, Eagle Heavy. It's a very reliable spacecraft. All right, here we are. Now, this thing's total 8,700 and 31 meters per second delta V. If we pull out our calculator and say the surface of Kerbin to the surface of Duna, it is 6,130 meters per second. So yes, this thing does have enough power to get to the surface of Duna, but not back to the orbit of Duna. It needs our orbiter for that extra kick. 
So we're gonna take our ascent guidance here and our orbital altitude is going to be, uh, let's call it at 145. Engage. Is it me or do we have more of those? What the? Those are a couple of the things from our previous launch. Why are they there? <laughs> it is so cool watching this. The, the, the launch of an Eagle Heavy just never gets old with me for some reason. It's a very reliable lifting craft. It's a powerful lifting craft. Oh, you're starting your turn already? Okay, sure. I mean, you do what you want. Just stop wobbling. I mean, you can wobble all you want. We have the Delta V to spare. We will make it. a little bit top heavy but then again we had to launch this thing full we didn't have a choice all right now you're starting to worry me whether or not you're gonna roll over if I gave it RCS control it might just overload itself and flip over Getting aerodynamic effects here. All things considered, it looks good. Definitely a faster launch speed than uh, the God rocket. It's an obnoxiously slow to launch vehicle. I forgot to put piece a certain piece on this thing. Damn it. Okay, trying this again. I just wanted a vehicle assembly, put the part on, and relaunched it. It's some tiny, tiny EVA struts on the exterior right there on off of the ailerons there. Just so we can attach it more effectively to the Pegasus. Just strap it in for transit and then uh, take it all the way to Duna. Use it there back. All the goodness. Oh yeah, and it's all, it also has a full RCS package on board. It's going to be awesome. It's going to be awesome. If it ever stops wobbling gonna have to stop wobbling, otherwise we can't do staging. And staging is coming up here pretty soon. About, about a minute, I'd say. About one minute. Let's see if we can get the damn rocket under control before then. Don't know why the drive cones feel the need to wig out like this. Thankfully, it's generating enough of its own power to be able to... Oh! Oh, is it the rover? The Too Smart is a little bit heavier now. That... Is that what's messing us up? No! No, no, that, that thing rolls and kicks ass. It's these fins, I bet. They fucking suck. Either way, it looks like we've stopped wobbling, which is good. Alright, here we go. Staging. Oh, a little close there. And there go the fins. We're all 
also launching this thing without a shroud. Big land too. I think big. Like what NASA landed on the moon, that was tiny compared to this. Tiny <laughs> Their their rover was small too. The, the Two Smart has been an extremely reliable rover forever, and I see no reason why it should stop coming with us on our space expeditions now. Absolutely no reason. Alright, once we have orbit here, I'm gonna go ahead and uh, dump the main engine. Even though it's getting a fuckload of fuel. I mean, look at that, look at all that fuel. So is 1,500 left. You know what, we'll see how much we're left with once we're done uh, coasting to the edge. Oh, speed, Jesus! This is the, the this is the fastest launch we've had in a while. All right, go ahead and decouple it. We'll use the Rhino engine for orbital maneuvering. Which, we should get good thrust-to-weight ratio on that. Alright, go ahead and auto-warp as needed. That will fall away from us, eventually. Because, eventually, we're gonna fly away from it. Unless it decides that it's gonna fall into our orbital plane. No, 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 looks like we're good. Jesus Christ, we're up high. Like, we go into space all the time, but this is a pretty high orbit here. All right, ditching that engine. This thing only has two onboard solar panels, but along with that, it has uh, two radioisotope thermoelectric generators off of the cargo bays. Let's see how it performs SAS. Whoa. Whoa. Oh, did you see that? <laughs> uh, in this retrograde, I'd like to s Wow. How's its power doing? Electric shut. Well, we might actually still be running it. Yeah, turn that off. No, no, it can handle itself pretty okay. Uh, you can close this though. That's for the. That's more for the surface of Duna than anything else. But hey, if you want to leave the antenna on the two smart open, communicate via that. That works with that. That's fine with me. I said, no, close it. We have two very small antennas. These are short range antennas. All right. So this thing's maneuverable as hell. Like surprisingly so. It's it's amazing. All right, so Pegasus is behind us. We're going to give this uh, rendezvous autopilot a 
rendezvous autopilot a try. See how well this thing performs. Its reaction wheels are, uh, they eat up a lot of power because we got eight on the, um, around the rim here and then a big one in there, not to mention this thing and the onboard and the rhinos onboard gimbals. And I think there are more here. Yes, there are more there. <laughs> Yeah, we don't need that giant engine for orbital maneuvers. This thing works just fine. Honestly, if we had a barge, we'd be landing that first stage. Or at least making an attempt. Look at that, that is cool. It's amazing how well this thing turns. Only one problem. It's not going to have any RCS for when it flies away from the rocket. Oof. Oof. Nice. I've been flying engine blocks and tankers for the past couple days. A, respo a, a responsible craft helps. A very responsive craft helps immensely. And this is an extremely responsive craft. But it's so responsive, it's painful. It looks like we just passed an object. There is a lot of space junk out right now. Nice. Did the full goddamn maneuver. Like sometimes it ha it needs to bleed off a little bit more um, meters per second. And with the tanker, that takes an additional 60 seconds. Which, when you're performing precise rendezvous maneuvers like this, that is not acceptable. All right, home and transfer for intercept after 5.89 phasing orbits, which will take three in-game hours. <clears throat> It'll be worth the wait. This is the last cargo craft. It's not even cargo. It's an essential part of the mission. This is our lander. We need it. We're going to make our best attempt to land without engines. That way we'll have all the meters per second we'll need to get back to the ship. Ideally, we don't even have to dock with the ship when going home. We just need to do a quick spacewalk over to the ship. Carry all our stuff over, including our rocks, whatever rocks we may pick up. Oh boy, this is going to take a long time. <laughs> Probe. I don't know why I put the... Uh, th th there's a control module underneath the docking hatch. I don't know why I put it there, but I did.
because this thing's going to have the two smart attached to it. Ch chances are it's going to have the two smart on board. Calm signal is good. I remember there was a mod where you had the communications delay. And you had to account for every single communication delay. And that's and that 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 sounds terrifying. <laughs> Cuz I think my last estimate there was a 7 minute command time delay between Earth and Mars. I'd imagine Duna and Kerbin are about the same. More or less. All right, we're 45 minutes out from this. Our uh, intercept. It's taking a while, isn't it? All right, by my estimate, we uh, we should be able to pull this off in about one more orbit because right now we're just spinning around like crazy. Just pray we don't slam into any phantom objects or asteroids. I think that's the Kerbal Space Program Center down there. It's been a, it's been enough time for it to switch over to night, I guess. All right, for some reason it's realigning itself. I thought it realigned itself already. I mean, I'm not complaining. You do what you need to do. Once the lander is attached, we're going to redo all the math. All right, it actually just got misaligned again. So I guess it's a good thing that it decided to realign itself. Yeah, realign yourself again. You have the control for that, don't worry. You're an extremely maneuverable spacecraft. Look at that, that is really precise. On intercept course, finally. Took us long enough. We're also going to have to precision dock this thing. We're going to have to roll it. So then again, this, this ship isn't that heavy. The fuel tank, however, is. We'll see what happens. I had to update Mechanical Jeb because the docking autopilot was being awful. All right, we just got a huge lag spike right there. The ship just came into visual range. Which, for those of you who don't know, visual range is about two kilometers. Hey, look, there it is. Oh my god, you're big. Like, that is huge. It's also facing the wrong direction, but that's not an issue. We can spin it relatively simply. I would like it to be easier to spin that thing. I remember with the old engine, we could spin it really well. Moving slower now because 
no goddamn, uh, no low part count to speak of here. That thing has a lot of pieces on it. It's gonna be an extremely laggy ride all the way to Duna. All right, run approach, get it spinning. Oddly enough, it's keeping up with the power, even on the dark side of Kerbin. Well, I suppose that's not exactly odd. Once we, before we fire the engines, we're going to want to strap every single thing on that rocket down. Maybe even the two smart. Let's see, the two smart is pretty pretty well attached to its uh, main ship, isn't it? All right, no, you're good. You're good. You can disengage your autopilot now. Activate SAS, though. Stop the spinning. Stop the spinning. Thank you. Okay. I need you to, uh, wrong way. I just need you to spin around for me, please. Take it slow. Take it slow. Thankfully, once we're out in the black, we won't have too many maneuvers to worry about. You just can't spin this thing too fast. We'll tear the ship in half. It is extremely fragile because freaking squad devs don't believe in hard docking ports. I said it. I'm sick of these magnets. I wish we could just lock them down. As long as these arms don't give us too much trouble. Oh, but they will when we fire up the engine. You are still spinning, right? Yeah. It's still spinning. Yeah, so yeah, this is looking a lot more friendly approach-wise. God forbid we have this thing do any of the docking work. <laughs> Never. As far, as far as docking goes, this is a stationary object now. It's too heavy. It's way too heavy. All right, that's good. Stop right there. I didn't want to cheat a little bit with time warp, but we did. Okay, you falls in your court now. Lock on to the docking port. Set that as your target. Docking autopilot. Force roll to zero degrees. Yeah, see, there's our speed limit of 0 0.1 from the last launch. For this first part, why don't we give it a top speed of one?
Hey, uh, what are you doing here? I see. Uh, disable the autopilot real quick. Do we really need that giant engine to help us dock? No. <laughs> no, we do not. So, orbit-wise, aim yourself retrograde. You're going home. You aim yourself mostly retrograde? Oh, it's trying very hard to aim itself mostly retrograde. And it's good. <laughs> Fuck! What'd you break? Uh... Drive cone is intact. It's wobbling a little bit. That was a pretty nasty impact. Ugh. Can we dock with just this? Oh yeah, we can dock with just this. This is where all the power is, all of the thrusters are, not to mention it's a much smaller object. And a lighter object. Just don't burn too much of that fuel. There is a limited amount of fuel. And, you're all, and they're also going to need fuel to dock again when they're coming back. I'm also planning on using the RCS thrusters to enter Duna's atmosphere. That's not going to hit the ground, is it? Hey, look, it's the Space Center. Pretty sure that's the space center. Moving towards start position. It had to back up first. We disabled the RCS on the capsule. It should have much better control. maneuver. Thankfully, this object is much smaller than the engine or the tanker. The God rocket is an insanely powerful rocket, but it, 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 it is not maneuverable. When it comes to maneuvers like this, we need something a lot more stable. fuel is left in the tank. Alright, you've only burned about 55 out of the 750. Granted, this thing has a lot of thrusters. Force roll 90 degrees. That's more like it. It has to be aerodynamically perfect, otherwise it's gonna wobble off. And I'm still not entirely sure if it's 
going to wobble off or not. I wish we had time acceleration with this. We do not. Does the starting distance have to be 30 meters? Sorry, 38, apparently. So it's more like 40, isn't it? The distance to the dock is 41.76. Uh, can we speed this up, please? I kind of wanted to get out of here um, during our next orbit. I keep seeing that tiny object off in the distance. I know what it is, but it's unsettling to see another object out this close. far is it, actually? That was an impressive crash. It broke off the entire fuel tank and the engine. Didn't break anything on the lander. But this thing basically just stabbed it. All right, moving forward towards the dock. Once we get to about 10 meters, we'll decrease our speed to one-tenth of what we're at now. This is just to get us close. Also, I'm tired of incredibly slow docking maneuvers. And it, ha it has been incredibly slow. For a, for a really long time, during this whole build process. All right, 14 meters. 13 meters. Easy. 12 meters. 11 meters. All right, 10 meters, tap the brakes. Now approaching at point one. Three times as fast as the speed they, in which they dock at the space station. The real one. The one in real life. Take it easy. It might fall apart. Last thing we want is imbalance, which is why we force a roll of 90 degrees. These are incredibly large drive cores. How the weight of this will affect it is yet to be seen. But those arms are gonna need to be locked down again. How are we doing fuel-wise? Six, seven, four. Doing good. Gonna need to remember we might need the same amount when we dock again. But we're gonna have a lighter craft by, by then, because these are gonna be gone. These will be these will be jettisoned during the ascent. plan to get to Duna is pretty much the same plan that NASA had, but this is better than NASA. Better than NASA. <laughs> Very easy. Gently. We'll get the engineers ready. 
or two engineers. They're way down here. In the engineering deck. They are Joff Key and Mr. Kerman. Joff Key will be uh, moving up to the front here in preparation for a spacewalk where we will attach the cables. Careful now. Boy, we're right on it. Yes. All right. Get Joff Key moving. Transfer into that capsule. Joff Key, go EVA. This is not very comfortable. We just docked. Uh, prepare a report, actually. Now, those struts. Attach them right onto the circles, actually. That's a good idea, actually. And these back one and these back ones here. Eh, screw it. Circles. We're going circles with these. We also have four right on top of the docking port, but they're not going to stretch nearly as far unless we want to put one directly on the cockpit, but that's going to obstruct our view. But you guys saw what the last freaking one did. The last lander we brought up did. It wobbled all over the place on the way home. We're trying to keep that from happening this time. So... We do is tie everything down as best we can, and that is as best as it's gonna get. <laughs> Six, no, seven struts. Seven struts attached to this thing. How's our delta v with that thing attached? It took away about three hundred. Oh, about 100 meters per second delta V, which isn't bad. Honestly, that's pretty efficient. All right, transfer the crew around. We got to get them ready for our uh, interplanetary burn. Actually, it's not the interplanetary, is it? It's, uh, it's we leave the Kerbin system burn. Actually, Mr. Kerman, if you could stay in engineering, that'd be, that would be swell. But that'll do it for this week's episode of the Headhunter Space Program. And in the next episode, it will finally be time. We're finally leaving. So with that, thank you guys so much for watching. If you liked it, go ahead and hit the like button really hard with your head. This is the completed ship. The thing that we've worked so hard for so long. It really is beautiful. It's a beautiful ship! <laughs>